Hello, and welcome to the opening of our newest exhibition. It was We the People, Not We the White Male Citizens, the 19th Amendment Centennial. And while we can't have our more traditional exhibit opening, we did still want to be able to share this story with all of you today. We are going to walk you through a collection of photos and artifacts from the women's suffrage movement and for the battle for equal voting rights, which culminated 100 years ago. So we start off here, prior to the 19th Amendment in fact, at an earlier attempt to give Pennsylvania women the right to vote. As you can see on this map, in certain areas of the U.S., women were allowed to vote prior to 1920 and the passage of the 19th Amendment. Wyoming, for example, allowed equal suffrage as a territory, and upon demanding that their women remain allowed to vote, became the first state admitted to the Union allowing women to vote in 1890. Over the next 30 years, other states joined them until the country was fairly evenly split by 1914. Pennsylvania, however, was not one of them, as women could not vote in any elections held within the Commonwealth. However, the measure did make it to a referendum in 1915, and while it did pass in Luzerne County by a vote of 14,639 to 11,501, it was defeated statewide by the margin of 441,034 to 385,348. During the campaign before the ill-fated vote, one noteworthy tactic developed. A 2,000-pound bronze replica copy of the Liberty Bell was cast and went on campaign stops across the Commonwealth. Other than not featuring the original's famous crack, the only other change was the phrase, and established justice was added to the bell's inscription. Due to this, the replica became known as the Justice Bell. The bell started touring in Bradford County in the spring of 1915 and would cover over 5,000 miles across the Commonwealth before the fall election. While on tour, speakers would show the audiences that the bell's clapper was symbolically chained down, and it would only ring out once suffrage was granted. Unfortunately, the bell would not ring for over five years after being finished. Another major turning point in the fight for the vote was when America joined World War I in April 1917. It was the war to end all wars. And it quickly became clear that the entire nation would need to be mobilized in order to be victorious. American women rose to the occasion of their country's need. Even before America was formally in the war, millions of women had founded and supported volunteer organizations tasked with sending relief aid to Europe. Upon declaration of war, these volunteer groups saw members explode. Over eight million women joined the American Red Cross alone during the war years. World War I, also saw U.S. women in uniform for the first time. Women could be employed in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, serving as yeomen, nurses, switchbird operators, famously nicknamed Hello Girls by the French, truck drivers, ambulance workers, clerks, and cryptographers. These women served as fully and bravely as the men did overseas and sacrificed just as much. Indeed, from just over 34,000 American female nurses serving in Europe, 236 lost their lives. As the war raged on, suffrage took on a new, more patriotic angle. 
How could President Wilson claim that the U.S. was fighting to bring the rights of democracy and self-determination to Europe when women here at home, millions of whom served the nation and aided in achieving victory overseas, lacked such rights themselves? Two other major marketing campaigns arose in the run-up to the passage of the 19th Amendment. The most iconic of all was the distinctive gold, white, purple color scheme adopted by the American suffragette. This actually evolved from an earlier borrowed green, white, purple scheme of the Women's Social and Political Union of England. Purple stood for royalty, white for purity, and green for hope. Elizabeth Cady Stanton modified the green to gold for the United States in 1867 to match the sunflower, which was the state flower of Kansas, which was holding a referendum on suffrage that year. On both sides of the pond, the purple was often referred to as violet, creating the acronym GWV, which represented not only the colors, but also give women votes as well. One of the more successful strategies in the run-up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment was devised by President of the Pennsylvania Women's Suffrage Association, Jenny Bradley Rossing. Ms. Rossing actually came up with the tactic during the earlier 1915 Pennsylvania referendum. Rossing's strategy, named the Pittsburgh Plan, then later changed to the Pennsylvania Plan, was to prepare suffragists of both sexes who are articulate speakers to lobby lawmakers and canvass the state for popular support. The Pittsburgh plan utilized door-to-door -door canvassing and field offices in 56 of Pennsylvania's 67 counties in order to win the hearts and minds of the male voters who would go to the polls. Canvassers were outlined with talking points and counterpoints to present a professional reasoned argument. As the U.S. suffrage movement was in full swing, American women were fighting a parallel battle for change of a much more visual and day-to-day -day variety. Fashion became wilder with shorter skirts, lower waists, and beaded dresses becoming in vogue. Wealthier ladies wore wraps and fur coats, often with long straight gowns with gloves to parties. Perfumes, nail polish, and makeup became more widespread with companies such as Chanel and Tangi debuting during this time. Shorter hair became trendy, including the bob cup for which bobby pins were created, often paired with a headband or hat. American women at this time also wanted more freedom from societal norms. Women began smoking in public, often carrying gilded cigarette cases in their beaded purses. Before and especially during prohibition, drinking from a hip flask, often tucked into a garter, was one of the calling cards of the ladies later known as flappers. Women involved in bootlegging often wore hollowed out corset flasks to smuggle liquor to speakeasies. Finally, women began asserting their independence literally by driving. Ladies across the country became licensed and hit the open road, reducing their reliance on their husbands and families for transport and shattering another turn of the century taboo all in one. The opposition to the suffrage movement was just as well organized as the suffragettes, but just who exactly were the opposition? Well, the leading organization was the aptly named National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, or NAOWS. 
While the general rank and file membership of the NAOWS was overwhelmingly male, many of the individuals in power within the group were women. They were women of rank, privilege, wealth, and even in certain places, political power. And they were perfectly comfortable under the current system. Their official reasoning was often that voting rights would remove a woman's femininity and grace and slowly erode what it meant to be female in America. However, despite all the efforts of the opposition, on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified and women had the right to vote. In 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed, everyone knew that there were going to have to be changes to the law. Women were equal now when it came to voting rights. However, they were also equal in the eyes of the law when it came to jury duty and, more importantly, taxes. At least locally, the only concern of the media seemed to be on the tax question, which really was a series of questions. How much tax would women have to pay? Would it be the same as men? Would it be occupation-based? Would it be property-based? What would homemakers have to pay? Would taxes on males decrease now that women paid too? Only one thing was for sure. If you wished to vote, you had to pay. The Wilkes-Barre Record Almanac reported that due to the very close proximity of the ratification to the county elections, a temporary assessment was made. Six cents tax due for every housewife or other woman not engaged in gainful employment, and 18 cents on all women who worked. From the following year on, all men and women would be assessed equally by occupation. Due to the tax question, the 1920 election had a very poor female turnout locally, as many women incorrectly believed that if they did not vote, they would not have to pay taxes. However, they were assessed just the same. One fun tie-in are these new stamps released by the United States Postal Service this August to commemorate the 100th anniversary. In addition to flying the gold, white, and violet once again, these stamps tie in nicely with this book of stamps from 1915. Now, stamps as we know them today were not even produced nationwide until 1847, and even then were not required on U.S. mail until 1855. However, production of quote-unquote legal stamps was always handled by a government agency, either the USPS itself or the U.S. Treasury, etc. Despite this, many third-party organizations produced their own postage stamps to promote their causes, similar to the Easter seals still around today. These stamps, while looking legitimate, were sold solely for marketing purposes. This book, created for the failed 1915 Pennsylvania suffrage referendum, actually has printed on the cover in capital letters, these stamps must not be used on face of envelope. We leave you now with this powerful image. This is the Luzerne County Women's Suffrage Party. These were the women fighting for the vote on the front lines right here at home, led by their chairwoman, Catherine Lance. After proudly voting in their first election in 1920, they stopped and posed for this timeless photo. Their mission accomplished, they were able to celebrate, and here we are, 100 years later, recognizing that celebration again. 
the members of the Luzerne County Women's Suffrage Party, seated row, Mrs. Catherine Lance, chairwoman, Miss Louise Hodge, Mrs. John Bridgman, second row, Mrs. H. H. Harvey, president, Olive Van Horn, Mrs. Edith Brewer, Mrs. E. Butler Beaumont, Miss Elise Beaumont, third row, Mrs. James Gar, Mrs. Harvey, Mrs. Andre B. Beaumont, Mrs. Margaret Elliott, Miss Anna Hazley, Miss Helen Dougherty, back row, Miss Elizabeth White, Mrs. Emily Johnson, Mrs. Katie M. Posey. We would like to thank you for joining us on this tour. It was We the People, not We the White Male Citizens. And we would like to thank the League of Women Voters for their contributions to this exhibition. The exhibition will run through the spring of 2021. This video tour and the exhibition at large were made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our museum is once again open by reservation. If you would like to view the exhibit, please call 570-823-6244, extension 3, or email reservations at luzernhistory.org. Thank you all for joining us. Goodbye.